going on, Vinyl Community? Welcome to another video with The Record Spinner. In today's video, I am going to be ranking the King Crimson Studio Catalog. This was a rather interesting task to take on simply because King Crimson has never really conformed to one singular musical identity. Various eras of the band are distinguishedly different, but across their entire discography, regardless of which era it's from, there is still this element of complexity and experimentation that still distinguishes it as Crimson. And throughout this ranking, I am also going to be pointing out the lineup that has appeared on each record because there seems to be more King Crimson members than there are albums. And it just goes to show that King Crimson is very much a collective of musicians and each member provided something unique and worked in their own abilities to the structure of King Crimson's music. Now, let me emphasize by saying that this ranking is solely my opinion. It is neither right or wrong. If you think Islands is their best album, then I respect respect your opinion, but who knows, maybe we'll see eye to eye on some things. But enough of the chit chat, let's jump into what this video is all about. So there are 13 King Crimson studio albums and coming in at number 13 at the bottom of the barrel is this one. 2000's The Construction of Light or the reconstruction of light, depending on how you look at it. Um, this features the double duo lineup of Adrian Ballou, Robert Fripp, Trey Gunn, and Pat Mastelotto. And honestly, I found this album to be very musically dense. I found it kind of lacking melody in places, and it sounds like the band is kind of unsure on where to take their musical direction. And you would think before this album, uh, with the various projects that the band had done, um, they would find some sort of common ground, but that wasn't really the case. Um, and also, another factor that kind of affected the overall vibe of this album was the fact that they didn't really road test any of the tunes prior to recording, because that's something that King Crimson always did. They would always perform new stuff in a live setting because they are a fantastic live band. So right off the bat, with them not playing this stuff live before release and kind of testing out, you know, the arrangements and everything, they found themselves working in a very different musical environment, which I feel kind of just affects this album overall. And from a production standpoint, um, Pat Mestolato's usage of the Roland V drums kind of give this unnatural kind of drum sound to it, which affects the overall production. But coincidentally, when the album got remixed uh, for stereo and 5.0, one, they could not locate the drum tracks. So I guess it was a kind of a blessing in disguise that Pat Mestolato actually reimagined his drum parts and re-recorded them using natural drums, and that became released as the reconstruction of lights. Now, musically on this, it's kind of in the same vein as Discipline with the interlocking guitars, but with a bit of a modern twist, um, kind of slower, and um, Robert Fripp offers some more distorted guitar passages. Some standout tracks um, is uh, King Crimson's Take on the blues with a track like Prozac Blues, which features some interesting vocals from Adrian Ballou, um, who kind of filters his voice to come across as sounding like a very guttural kind of Tom Waits style. Um, the title track is particularly good. There's some hints of the band's past with a track like Fractured, which is almost like a modern kind of revamping of the song Fracture from Starless and Bible Black, as well as the fourth part of uh, the Lark's Tongues and Aspic series, which I feel part four is perhaps the weakest part. It just doesn't really convey too much. Um, it's an album that definitely requires several listens to try to wrap your head around, but nonetheless, I just kind of found this album to be the weakest from them. Coming in at number 12 is this album. 1984's Three of a Perfect Pair. Now, this album features the 80s lineup of Robert Fripp, Adrian Ballou, uh, Bill Bruford, and Tony Levin. And with this album, the way it's set up is that there is a left side, which is side A, and the right side, which is side B. The left side features the more accessible commercial tunes, uh, tracks such as the title track, Model Man, and Sleepless, which are definitely the strongest points of the record. But where the album kind of tends to kind of steer into the deep end is the right side, which is all the instrumental improvisations, uh, kind of in tune to like what the 70s King Crimson was was doing. And while experimentation and improvisations were are key components to the overall King Crimson sound, it doesn't quite suit what this particular lineup of Crimson was doing at the time. And sure, you can say that songs that stem from this era, like Indiscipline and The Sheltering Sky, can have some very improv moments. There were some slight structures to those tunes, so it kind of just seems like they took whatever they felt was suitable and slapped it on the B-side of this record, and it just 
doesn't quite fit. However, the big highlight on the right side is part three to Lark's Tongues and Aspic, which I think perfectly picks up where part two left off on uh, from the Lark's Tongues and Aspic record, but kind of just incorporates that modern 80s King Crimson sound to it, and it just fits really, really well. So there are some rather strong points on this record that stand out well, but it's that B-side that kind of brings it down a bit. Coming in at number 11 is this album. 1982's Beats. Now, this album preceded Three of a Perfect Pair, so it does feature the same lineup, and this was also the first King Crimson album where the same lineup was used from the previous album. That's crazy to think about. Um, there is a loose theme going on with this record in regards to the beat generation, which is obvious because the album itself is called Beat, and as well as the song titles, there's some connections as well, particularly Neil and Jack and Me, which are references to Neil Cassidy and Jack Kerouac, and The Howler, which is a reference to Allen Ginsberg's uh, Howl. Uh, musically, it basically picks off where um, Discipline had left off on, but takes it in a more popular direction particularly with tracks such as Heartbeat and Waiting Man, uh, which are two great tracks on here. There's some other awesome tunes such as the opener, Neil and Jack and Me, and uh, Sartori and Tangier, which is a great instrumental. Side 2 opens up with Neurotica, which is just absolute bonkers in the very beginning, but has this really cool harmonized chorus. But where the album kind of just sort of tails off are, are the rest of the tracks on Side 2. We have Two Hands and The Howler, which are okay. They don't really stand up to the rest of the record. And then the album uh, ends with Requiem, uh, which is basically a improvisation, kind of in the vein of Frippertronics with the loops going on in the back. And Robert Fripp offers a pretty uh, stinging guitar lead with some crazy percussion from Bruford. It's a rather decent record for basically the first half, and then it kind of just veers off from there. Coming in at number 10 is this album. 2003's The Power to Believe. This features the double duo lineup of Robert Fripp, Adrian Ballou, Trey Gunn, and Pat Mastelotto. And as of filming this video, this is currently King Crimson's last studio album. And compared to what had come out before this record, being 2000's The Construction of Light, this is a huge improvement. It almost has this sort of industrial metal edge to it. Perhaps because around at the same time when this album was being worked on, uh, King Crimson had done a tour with Tool. So they perhaps took some notes off of them and incorporated some new elements into their sound. And in terms of the structure of this record, I kind of got the vibe of In the Wake of Poseidon. Particularly how we have The Power to Believe Parts 1 to 4 kind of interlaced throughout the record. Similar to what Poseidon has with the song Peace. And also it just seems too much of a coincidence because Part 1 is acapella. Just like Peace, a beginning on Poseidon. And then it kicks right into level five, which is basically Lark's Tongues and Aspect Part 5, which is just this absolutely heavy, muscular tune with some great distorted guitars and some great lead work from Adrian Ballou. Uh, then it kind of soothes down into Eyes Wide Open, which is a really awesome soothing tune. Uh, then we have the interlocking guitars with Electric. Then it goes into Facts of Life. Uh, we have a track called Dangerous Curves, which starts out very kind of ominous, and then it builds right up and explodes into the next track with Happy With What You Have To Be Happy With, which features some very interesting lyrics from Adrian Ballou about how we, we have the first verse, we have a distortion box to make the menacing, we go right into the chorus. It's rather interesting. Um, and then um, The Power To Believe Part 3 is actually a reworking of a song slash improvisation uh, that Crimson would do live around the time called The Deception of the Thrush, which is kind of a key track from this sort of later era of Crimson. So it's really cool that um, it's featured on the record. And honestly, if this turns out to be King Crimson's last studio album, I think they wrapped it up on a rather high note because this album is absolutely solid. Coming in at number nine is this album. 1995's Thrack. This is one of my personal favorites. And this features the double trio lineup, which basically is two of each instrument. So we have Robert Fripp and Adrian Ballou on guitar, 
Trey Gunn and Tony Levin on bass, and then Bill Bruford and Pat Mestolato on drums. And musically, it's kind of like a meeting point between the 70s Crimson and the 80s Crimson. We have the heavy harshness of an album like Red meeting the sort of rock gamelan interlocking guitars of Discipline. But what kind of gives this a twist is Adrian Ballou's vocal style and the way he delivers his melodies. It's almost in the vein of like 60s pop in some areas, where when you listen to tracks like Dinosaur, and Walking on Air, they sound like long-lost John Lennon Beatles tracks. It's really interesting, and it's a rather fresh approach to this record. Um, there's also some other great instrumental moments on here, such as Baboom, which is basically like a drum showcase, and then the title track, Thrack, which was basically um, an improvised piece live on, um, on stage, but using the same kind of motifs from the beginning of the song itself. Uh, we have the rather pop funk infused people uh then we have one time sex sleep eat drink dream inner gardens part one and two just all kinds of great songs on this record but what makes this album so enjoyable to listen to is the way that it is mixed. So like I said, this was the double trio lineup. And the way that it's mixed is basically you have a trio of mu musicians between both speakers. So on the left speaker, you have Robert Fripp, Trey Gunn, and Pat Mestolato. And then on the right speaker, you have Adrian Ballou, Tony Levin, and Bill Bruford. And on the opening track, Vroom, which is this great, awesome driving track, which almost sounds like it picks up where Red left off on, on the album Red, you hear the members kind of separate, and you have these two trios battling it out, kind of just providing counterpoints and counterfoils. Um, the best way to hear this album is listening to this great uh, 200 gram vinyl reissue, set yourself right in the middle between the speakers and you can hear these two trios kind of going back and forth. It's an absolutely thrilling listening experience and it just makes the overall listening experience really fun to be quite honest. Coming in at number eight is this album. 1970s in the wake of Poseidon. Now we're getting into some classic territory here. Uh, this is kind of like a weird kind of fluctuating period of Crimson because there was no real definitive lineup. Uh, basically reinstated from the first album in the Court of the Crimson King, we have Robert Fripp, of course, on guitar, Peter Sinfield, who wrote the lyrics, Greg Lake on vocals, and then Michael Giles on drums. And to add some new blood into Crimson, we have... Um, Peter Giles on bass, which is Michael Giles' brother. So basically, you have a Giles, Giles, and Fripp reunion on this album, which, of course, was the band before King Crimson. Uh, Gordon Haskell, who sings uh, on the track Cadence and Cascade. Mel Collins, who does saxophone and flute. And then we have uh, Keith Tippett, who provides some uh, piano flourishes on Cat Food. And honestly, this album is kind of like in the court of the Crimson King Redux. It kind of follows the same formula for the most part. Um, apparently, it was not intentional, but it just seems very coincidental. Um, basically, the album, like I mentioned, like in Power to Believe, opens up with this track called Peace, A Beginning, which the beginning is a cappella. There's the main theme, which is acoustic guitar right in the middle, and then it ends with a uh, vocal and guitar at the very end. And then we have Pictures of a City, which almost sounds like it's trying to recreate the magic of 21st Century Schizoid Man with the distorted guitars and the syncopated middle section, but it doesn't really quite recapture it. Uh, then it goes Goes into Cadence and Cascade, which is this very nice, peaceful tune, very similar to um, I Talk to the Wind. And like I mentioned, uh, Gordon Haskell sings on that track, which is a hint of what is to come on the next album, but we're going to talk about that in a bit. And then we have the title track in the wake of Poseidon, which is basically like Epitaph, with, which is very kind of Mellotron driven, very similar. Um, and then on the B-side, we have a track called Cat Food, which was released as a single, and it gained um, the band an appearance on Top of the Pops. And then we have The Devil's Triangle, which is basically like a rewriting of Gustav's Mars, which was a piece that Crimson played live a lot back in 1969. So it kind of just seems like in the court, just kind of repackaged and rejiggered. So it kind of lacks new ideas, but nonetheless, the songs are relatively awesome. Coming in at number seven is this album, 1971's Islands. Now, this features the second definitive King Crimson lineup of Robert Fripp on guitar, 
Peter Sinfield writing the lyrics, Buzz Barrel on bass and vocals, Ian Wallace on drums, and Mel Collins on saxophone and flute. And this is a very musically interesting record across the board. It opens up with a track called Formentera Lady, which has this female soprano vocal kind of soaring towards the end, and then it goes right into Sailor's Tale, which features this awesome guitar solo from Fripp. Almost, it sounds like an electric banjo. It is so sweet. Then the Mellotrons kick right up and it's very menacing and dark. It is just awesome. Then we have uh, the Letters, which features some very airy yet powerful vocals from Boz, a sort of freeform jazz middle section, which is quite interesting. Then we get to Ladies of the Road, which is almost like done in a raunchy R&B kind of style. But the lyrics, oh my gosh, they are, it's some of Peter Sinfield's cringiest lyrics. I liken the lyrics uh, of Ladies of the Road to like Shakespearean kiss lyrics. You must read them for yourself. And then we have Prelude Song of the Gulls, which features a, um, a string quartet, which is pretty cool. And then it closes out with the title track, Island, which is just this beautiful, soft, jazzy kind of tune. Um, it is just absolutely gorgeous. When I saw King Crimson live during their 50th anniversary tour, they played it. And honestly, that was the highlight of the night for me. But this album signals the ending of like the first era of King Crimson, because this was... The last album that Peter Sinfield was involved in, he wanted to kind of stay in the jazz folk kind of vein, whereas Fripp wanted to get more instrumental and more harsher later on. So this album is kind of like the end of an era, but it definitely gave way into some of the more important eras of Crimson's career. Coming in at number six is this album. 1970s Lizard. This features the lineup of Robert Fripp on guitar, Peter Sinfield writing the lyrics, Gordon Haskell on bass and vocals, Andy McCulloch on drums, and Mel Collins on saxophone and flute. It's kind of hard to look at that as a lineup considering that they never toured and they were only paid as session players. It kind of just follows that weird kind of transitional period after In the Wake of Poseidon. Uh, but before I get into the music, I just need to say that this right here is some of my favorite album artwork, how it spells out the band's name and with the big letters and the various details inside, which are obviously references to the lyrics uh, featured on this album. Uh, musically, this is King Crimson's jazziest album. This album is just crazy, crazy bonkers. It opens up with perhaps one of the big highlights of this record, which is the song uh, Circus, which has this great Mellotron kind of riff with da 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 It's absolutely awesome. Peter Sinfield's vocals on this are, it just paints a picture in your head of being at a circus. Then we have things like Indoor Games, Happy Family, which has Gordon Haskell's vocals kind of synthesized through the uh, VCS3 synthesizer and just there is a lot going on uh, throughout that song. It is just crazy. Uh, then we kind of have some pastoral peacefulness of Lady of the Dancing Water. And then there is the big epic sidelong piece of the title track, Lizard, which features uh, John Anderson from Yes on vocals for the first part. I guess perhaps because Gordon Haskell, since he has that kind of soulful, kind of gritty kind of voice, he couldn't quite pull off the vocal, so they got John to do it. Uh, then there is the kind of classical music meets jazz-infused bolero in the middle, which is just absolutely beautiful. And then we have um, the Battle of the Glass Tears, which basically just kind of wraps up the entire thing. And uh, this is an adventurous album to listen to, but it is crazy with the arrangements in terms of the production, uh, which is why I believe just that, that original mix just sounds so cluttered, and maybe that's why Robert Fripp had always kind of... Um, spoke out in terms of his distaste for this record. Uh, but it wasn't until the Stephen Wilson remix uh, from, I think it was 2009, 2010, that Fripp had said, quote unquote, he heard the music in the music. And he's right. It just allows the record to breathe a bit more. So I would say if you're going to experience this album, I would say check out the Stephen Wilson remix because it is quite, I would say, better than the original mix. But it is musically adventurous. It's one of my personal favorites. And it is just, like I said, absolutely crazy but enjoyable at the same time coming in at number five is this album 1974's starless and bible black 
This right here is my favorite King Crimson record, and it features my favorite King Crimson lineup being Robert Fripp on guitar, John Wetton on bass and vocals, Bill Bruford on drums, and David Cross on violin. And I feel that this record perfectly captures that particular era of uh, Crimson, and that is through live improvisation. So this is a half live, half studio album, and what the band did was they recorded several shows uh, that they performed, and in between songs, they would do these various little improv pieces. And what they did was they went through the shows, picked out some improvs, took away the audience, and they put them on this record. And some examples of those improvs are things such as We'll Let You Know, Trio, Starless and Bible Black, the title track. Uh, there's even a track that was actually fully written but just was recorded live being Fracture, which is this amazing, amazing Crimson tune with Robert Fripp's insane guitar work, and then it just kicks right into overdrive towards the end. It is just brilliant um and then there's a couple of studio tracks on here as well particularly the uh, opener um the great deceiver lament as well as a piece of uh the night watch um this is just an absolutely great record full of concise tunes as well as some very interesting improvisations which like i said perfectly sum up this era of crimson coming in at number four is this album 1981's Discipline. This features the 80s lineup of Robert Fripp, Adrian Ballou, uh, Tony Levin, and Bill Bruford. Out were the Mellotrons, in were the times. And this is why I feel that King Crimson is perhaps the most truest progressive rock band ever because they were a band that was always adaptive to the times so this album features a more kind of new wave-ish kind of sound which is a total 180 compared to what we had been associated with when it came to other crimson albums from the 60s going into the 70s and an opening track like elephant talk which features kind of david byrne-esque kind of style vocals from adrian Ballou must have shocked fans at first but once you get to tracks like frame by frame and my Mate Kudasai. Um, Adrian offers this very nice sort of melodic approach to his vocal style, which is completely different in, in a way to what we had seen with vocalists like Greg Lake, Boz Burrell, and John Wetton. But still, musically, it is very crimson because it has that element of experimentation and improvisation, particularly on tracks like Indiscipline and The Sheltering Sky. Uh, there's also the song Thela Hun Jinji, which has um, a spoken word bit by by Adrian Ballou recounting a time when he um, encountered a gang and he was explaining his experience, not knowing that Fripp was recording the entire thing. So it adds this sort of interesting kind of sense into the track. And I can only begin to imagine what a Crimson fan from like 74 uh, listened to this album when it came out and realized that it was a totally different band. And that's why I feel that Discipline is the most challenging and important album to listen to in the crimson discography because if you can wrap your head around the new sounds that they were working with at this time you will begin to appreciate the future albums that would eventually follow coming in at number three is this album 1974's Red. Now, the band is basically a trio at this point. Uh, we have John Wetton, Bill Bruford, and Robert Fripp. And we do have some contributions from David Cross, who was kicked out of the band prior to recording this record. Uh, and we also have some contributions from King Crimson alumnus, such as Mel Collins and Ian McDonald on saxophone. And this album is King Crimson going in a more heavier kind of direction, particularly on the title track record which was written by Robert, which has this aggressive guitar riff, the da 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 It is just absolutely ripping. And then we have things like Fallen Angel, One More Red Nightmare, which is amazing. We have a live improvisation called Providence, which was recorded at a show in Providence. And then we have the epic Starless, which starts out very melancholic for the first four minutes with some great melodies from Robert Fripp. And then there's the middle section, which kind of starts out very small, and then it builds up, and then it just explodes to include this amazing saxophone work, repeating motifs and melodies from the beginning of the track. It is just absolutely 
powerful, powerful stuff. And a lot of people point to this album as being rather significant and for being one of their finest, at least in my opinion it is. A lot of people tend to think that it's kind of overrated. I see it as quite, you know, accessible in some areas because it is indeed King Crimson's most I would say polished sounding album from this early era because King Crimson albums in general always were recorded rather well, but the production on this album is jacked to the nines. We have layered guitars on tracks like Red. We have the added hand claps to things like One More Red Nightmare. Um, just some rather interesting stuff. And this was also the last uh, King Crimson album to come out in the 70s back when Robert Fripp said back then that King Crimson after the release of this record ceased to exist. Coming in at number two is this album, 1973's Lark's Tongues and Aspic. This album signals a new era of Crimson with the lineup of Robert Fripp on guitar, John Wetton on bass and vocals, Bill Bruford on drums, David Cross on violin, as well as Jamie Muir on percussion. And honestly, even though Jamie Muir only appears on this record and he only did, you know, the handful of, you know, European dates around this time frame, it's it's a small, you know, snapshot in time. I feel that his contributions are quite integral because from this point on, and particularly when it comes to like the percussive aspect of Crimson's music, there were always little bells and whistles going on. And it's all thanks to Jamie's contributions that he kind of left his mark and they had to fill that void somehow with Bruford or Pat Mastelato or any drummer that has appeared recently in Crimson. And, um, what an album this is. It starts off with Lark's Tongues and Aspic Part 1, which kind of, your ears get settled for the first couple minutes with the African thumb piano and the violin and the cymbal flourishes. Then the violin creeps right in, the band crescendos, and they just explode into this powerful riff, which almost is reminiscent of 21st Century Schizoid Man. Not exactly trying to kind of recreate the magic of it, but it delivers that same amount of power. Then we have a track um, called Book of Saturday, which features Fripp on guitar and John Wetton singing with some violin, which is very beautiful. Um, Exiles, which is another wonderful track with Mellotron and a nice uh, violin melody going on. Very beautiful stuff. Uh, perhaps one of the more recognizable tunes on this record for maybe the casual fan is a track called Easy Money. Then we have The Talking Drum, which crescendos just like almost, you know, like, like the opening track. It crescendos right on to the big climax of the record, which is Lark's Tongues and Aspic Part 2, which is just an absolutely fantastic closure. Probably uh, the most recognizable part of the whole uh, Lark's Tongues and Aspic series. And stylistically, uh, Fripp wanted to kind of get more of a sort of European improvisational kind of direction, similar to what he was kind of doing on a track like Sailor's Tale uh, on Islands. And uh, he definitely fulfilled that, and it charted a new era of Crimson, and uh, it definitely left its mark on their career, as it is one of their finest albums. And that leaves the number one spot left for one more album. And honestly, guys, you saw this coming. 1969's In the Court of the Crimson King. We have the first lineup of Robert Fripp on guitar, Peter Sinfield writing the lyrics, Greg Lake on bass, Michael Giles on drums, and Ian McDonald on saxophone and flute. Do I need to say anything about this record? Absolutely not. This is one of the most influential rock albums of all time. This is an album that I think every vinyl collector or music lover should own. Um, it is game-changing. It is the birth of progressive rock. I mean, granted, you know, we we had seen some hints of what was to come with things like Sgt. Pepper, Procol Harum, and the Moody Blues, but these guys, they were completely different from everyone else that was on the scene. This is the birth of progressive rock. This is the game-changing moment. Opens up with 21st Century Schizoid Man, which is just powerful by all means with the distorted guitars, Greg Lake's uh, distorted vocals, um, then the syncopated middle section, which no other band did back then, which is absolutely insane. We have the beautiful I Talk to the Wind, which has some nice um, harmonized vocals uh, by Ian McDonald and Greg Lake in the verses. And then we have Epitaph, which is this this dramatic piece driven by Mellotron with some of the most haunting lyrics I've ever heard in my life. I'm just going to recite a couple lines. The wall on which the prophets wrote is cracking at the seams. Upon the instruments of death, the sunlight brightly gleams. 
back in 1969, it was all peace, love, and whatever. That This was the total opposite. This was getting onto some darker, more serious level. And it is just amazing. And hell, even like when Greg Lake sings a lyric like, but I fear tomorrow I'll be crying. Yes, I fear tomorrow I'll be crying. I even shed tears. It just hits that hard. Uh, then we have uh, Moonchild, which is a relatively short song. Uh, then we have some kind of um, improvisation at the tail end, which kind of goes on for a bit. But then it reaches the climax of the song, The Court of the Crimson King, with those amazing um, harmonies and the great flute solo right in the middle. And right when you think the song is over, you hear the reeds kind of going off at the very end. And the band kicks right in with the uh, with the key modulation and does the main riff again. And it is amazing. This is just an absolutely magical record. Um, it never um, overstays its welcome. It's still relevant. It's still fresh. And it's an album that I certainly never get tired of. It is just that amazingly good. So there you guys go. That is my ranking of the King Crimson Studio Catalog. If you enjoyed this video, please go ahead, give it a like, subscribe to the channel. And if you want to support this channel, be sure to check me out on Patreon. See you guys in the next video. And most importantly, keep the records spinning.